Okay, so um, we often see pictures of brains overlaid with uh, colourful blobs in media and what those blobs really represent are usually statistical values. So they usually represent the confidence that a particular brain region, or rather the bold response associated with a particular brain region, is greater under one condition, one experimental condition, than another experimental condition. So for example, normally a T statistic, a T value of 2, is approximately related to a 5% chance that that event occurred by chance. Normally in brain imaging we would expect to get T values of more like 4 or 5, which might be represented as a more yellow or white colour on an image, so this will vary depending uh, on the particular study. And so those areas are, uh, represent a higher confidence that that particular area was activated. PET and fMRI uh, generally measure different things. So fMRI measures something called the blood oxygen level dependence signal, and that is the ratio of oxygenated to dehydrated. Uh, oxygenated haemoglobin in the blood and that changes depending on whether a brain area is active or not. This doesn't have any units, it's a proportion or a ratio. By contrast, PET is able to give us direct measures of brain blood flow on the one hand, so the amount of blood flowing through uh, a, an amount of tissue over a particular period of time. Uh, on the other hand, it might give us a measure of glucose metabolism, how much glucose was being used in that area. And both are indirect measures of brain activity, so both are indirect measures of the underlying electrical signal, which is something unfortunately with whole brain imaging that we can't really get a handle on. So the major uh, benefit of brain imaging and the research practice are unfortunately yet to be realised and that is a better understanding of the neural circuits that lead to symptoms of major psychiatric disorders such as depression or schizophrenia or a bipolar disorder. We hope to be able to understand why these symptoms actually occur and what the brain basis of these symptoms are in order that we might one day be able to inform clinical treatment. The major limitations of this technology, especially fMRI, are that the bold signal is an indirect measure. So we're measuring really something related to blood flow, but unfortunately the drugs that we give patients with psychiatric disorders often directly affect the blood flow as well as the underlying brain activity, and this can sometimes make it quite difficult to interpret. In terms of clinical practice, uh, fMRI doesn't currently have any utility, so there is no test that we can give a patient that might, for example, help with the diagnosis or prediction of the best treatment for that patient. However, these studies are currently being undertaken at different centres, and it is very much hoped that we'll be able to improve diagnosis and treatment using these kinds of approaches. I think the biggest problem with the representation of brain imaging data in the media is precisely because we present brain images and it's actually quite difficult without some kind of reading of the area to understand what those uh, blobs on the brains are supposed to understand. As long as we remember that those blobs represent not neural activity but the blood flow correlated with neural activity in almost all cases so they're actually measuring the blood flow and as long as we realize that they don't represent the uh, measurement of the brain activity or its surrogate per se but the statistical association of that underlying signal with the particular task of interest uh, then we will be able to interpret them more properly. But the issue is, of course, that when we simply present an image without explaining it very well, uh, it's very easy to get the idea that the brain has lit up like a Christmas tree in a particular area. Whereas, of course, what we're really measuring is the blood flow and presenting the associated st statistical value uh, normally in terms of the colour on a blob.